Then I move on to these environments, the industrial environments. So this is a picture from uh, India, from Patanchero, uh, where there is a large number of pharmaceutical industries in a very small place. And many of them transport their wastewater from the production to a common effluent treatment plant, this one. Here. So here's the process water from the drug manufacturing that goes into the treatment plant. Here. And um, we published a paper some, now it's 12 years ago, where we analyzed drugs in the treated effluent that was released from this plant into a, a river. And in normal sewage treatment plants, you find nanograms per liter of drugs. But the concentrations we found here were thousands of micrograms, milligrams. About so for some of these, it's a million times higher than what you normally found in a sewage treatment plant. From a large number of different drugs, including broad spectrum antibiotics, such as the fluoroquinolone antibiotics. But also many other large selling drugs that we use here in the West. So this is maybe difficult to grasp, but the difference here is some nanograms, some micrograms, but I just to give a picture, this is what we find in India of ciprofloxacin in this treatment plant. This is what we normally would find in a Swedish or European treated effluent. And this is about how big the difference is. Now, some researchers think that this is actually selecting for resistance. So my message here is not that we shouldn't care at all about this mosquito. My message is that we should care a lot about this one. Because this one clearly selects for resistance. The concentrations here in the water is far higher than what you have in the blood when you're treated with the antibiotic. So I calculated here, based on the mass flow, of the flow of water here, that in one day, 44 kilos of ciprofloxacin was released in one day. 44 kilo. Let's put that in perspective. At that time, the entire population in Sweden used nine kilos per day of that important antibiotic. So this is about five times Sweden's entire use of this important antibiotic that came out from that pipe in one day. That would be enough to treat a city of 90,000 people with antibiotics every day. Everyone. And this has severely uh, contaminated the environment. We see here that when we analyze the sediment here, we find almost one gram per kilogram organic material here is ciprofloxacin. You could almost mine it from the ground here. It's like a small spoon in a, in a liter, right, is, is ciprofloxacin. This. We've also looked at the uh, well waters, the, the groundwater in surrounding villages. And in all of the villages here, we found highly elevated levels of different drugs, including antibiotics, not milligrams, but microgram per liter levels of drugs in their drinking water. And these poor people, they don't have much other water sources to turn to. So India referred to this as, so India, nature referred to this as India's drug problem. But is this really India's drug problem? one may ask. I think it's a bigger problem than that. I think it's our problem too, from, from different standpoints. Um, these factories produce the drugs that you and I use, as we have shown in this and actually another study published last year or the year before. Also. So uh, we are very much dependent on this cheap production on the other side of the planet. And then, of course, it's also our business 
if these releases spawn antibiotic resistance, right? Because, as I showed before, antibiotic resistance can travel all around the world. So, let's look how the bacteria look like in this treatment plant. Here is the resistant patterns of, of uh, bacterial isolates from the treatment plant. Uh, so these are uh, different isolates and we've tested them, how many antibiotics they are resistant to. There's not a single isolate that is resistant to one to four antibiotics. A typical antibiotic, a typical bacterium was resistant to 30 out of 39 tested antibiotic. That's the typical bacterium. There. I've never seen any environment with such extreme patterns of multi-resistance as this anywhere. And we've also done uh, a comparison of the number of resistance genes in these environments, in the polluted environments, downstream polluted environments, compared to other environments. I saw a similar picture before. So this is how many resistance genes there is per, basically per bacterium. And these are from human samples, some environmental samples, and here is the numbers near these manufacturing sites. Far, far more orders of magnitudes, two orders of magnitudes more than any other place on Earth, basically. So an extreme selection pressure for antibiotics. And when we look at genetic elements that move around antibiotic resistance genes, have you talked about integrons? Probably not. It's quite, it's a system by which bacteria collect resistance genes. Basically, it's a parking garage for, for uh, resistance genes, one could, one could say, uh, simplified. And these also are extreme in terms of how many uh, integrons these bacteria carry. So basically, systems of how to collect multi-resistance. And this may also be a bit too difficult, but it's also about transposition. These are, these are genes that make but make other genes move like jumping genes and if you look at human environments for example these are quite rare but here they're extremely common so these bacteria they are facilitated with all the means to collect resistance genes and shuffle them around and they are extremely common there as well and if we culture bacteria from these places and compare it to uh, Swedish lakes some other Indian lakes and some lakes here where they actually dump wastewater from the manufacturing sites. You can see that there are much, much higher levels of resistance to antibiotics there. Well, if they just stay there in the environment, maybe they're not such a big problem I showed you before, right? The big problem is when resistance factors are transferred to pathogens. So we did some experiments here with uh, basically sediment from the shore of some of these contamin contaminated lakes. And we let them grow together with uh, E. coli bacteria that were not resistant to antibiotics. And these E. coli bacteria were tagged with a glowing green protein. So they could they turn up green. So when we mixed them, we could find which, we which ones we added because they were glowing green afterwards. So you can see them here on a plate like this. These ones, for example, these are the ones that we added that glow, grow better. And when we do that, let's see how this works. We see that when we mix this, when we mix sediment from Swedish lakes, there is no green bacteria that grow when we add antibiotics because the, the green bacteria were not resistant to antibiotics. Not when we add uh, sediment from Indian lakes, but we when let the, the green bacteria sit together with bacteria from this contaminated Indian lake, they take up resistance genes. They take up resistance plasmids. And in a few hours, the green bacteria have become resistant to different classes of antibiotics. So the resistance that we find in the bacteria in this polluted environment can be transferred to E. coli within a matter of hours. And we've also characterized how these plasmids look like. And, and some of these are, are at least partly new forms of, of resistance plasmid. Yeah, maybe there is a picture of it there. That's more. I'll go to some conclusions on antibiotics on emissions overall. So 
When we use antibiotics, that leads to emissions of comparably low concentrations of antibiotics. They might select for resistance, they might be a problem, but clear evidence for this is still lacking. Could be a problem. Manufacturing discharges, which are much less common, of course, than usage of antibiotics, can lead to much higher, much, much higher concentrations in the environment. And here we find evidence for selection of multi-resistant bacteria. We find a wide variety of resistance genes enriched, and we can find that this is also easily transferred to pathogens. So I'd say that here's clearly a risk that we need to manage. This is possibly a risk that we need to manage. This is quite challenging because this involves basically every city in the world. This is much smaller number of places. Some antibiotics are produced in one or two places in the world and that's it. So that would be more manageable than this risk, I guess. But maybe both need to be managed. So I'll spend basically the last um, slide here on how you could um, work towards reducing emissions from antibiotic manufacturing. And one important aspect, I think, is to create awareness of this pollution problem. Because many people, many decision makers, are not aware that this can be an issue. They think that antibiotic use, that's, that's the risk factor, and that's the thing that we need to reduce. But antibiotic use, well, it also comes with something good, right? You treat an infection, or you prevent a disease, or you grow meat better, or whatever it is. Pollution with antibiotics doesn't really come with anything better, perhaps, than a bit cheaper drugs. So I think whether we have an opportunity here to, to reduce uh, pollution without reducing health, rather winning health. But for that, we need to create awareness. Because without awareness, nothing will happen. I think we need to increase transparency. With transparency, I mean basically information like where are drugs produced and under what conditions? Because when you buy drugs today at the pharmacy, you cannot figure out where it's produced. It may say made in Germany on the package, but that refers to the final product, not to the active ingredient that is inside the pill. That active ingredient is, in many, many cases, produced by some other company at some other part of the world where production is cheap. And the companies don't need to tell you, and they usually won't either. I think we need to have laws that changes this so that they have to tell where their stuff is produced. If they have to tell that, they reveal their chains, they reveal their links to sometimes perhaps dirty places somewhere else, and that creates incentives to clean, clean up in their backyard. Now they can hide behind sort of um, closed walls, because we cannot figure it out. That, I think, is a very cheap way to change this. Just have to change a law in EU, and then they need to show it, because the data is there. I've seen it myself for research purposes. I've, I've seen the data where it says where the drugs from this pill is produced exactly there, that factory, so it's there. Now we also need information how much the releases are, but in some places it's so dirty so that you don't need to measure. You just need to have a look and you see that that's not right, and you just have to smell. Now, other ways. Do you know about, what, do you know what, what generic substitution of drugs is? Some of you not. Well, if I say like this, when you go to the pharmacy, and the pharmacist says to you that, no, today it's actually this product you'll get. Not the same thing as the doctor prescribed, it's something else. If you want what the doctor prescribed, you have to pay yourself. But if you get this one, which is exactly the same thing, it's covered by, by the state insurance, right? So basically we have a system here that the state, 
they chip in and pay your medicines, your prescription medicines, but you need to choose the cheapest copy of the medicine. This is something that Sweden and many other countries have decided, and it saves us a lot of money to replace more expensive branded drugs to less expensive generic copies. But it doesn't, it's only price that determines how you do this substitution. I think it would be good if you also took into account if the companies have control of their pollution. And there's actually a proposal in the Swedish government to change this, but it has stalled, nothing has happened. There was a TV program on TV4 uh, this summer about this, where they're putting some pressure on our ministers to, to start changing this. I think there is a way forward, because otherwise it won't pay off to take responsibility, because it's still the cheapest one that will sell. Procurement, that's, that's a difficult word. It means when you buy things and you basically negotiate with your buyers. Uh, and that can be done by hospitals, for example. Hospitals that buy drugs, they can say that, well, we want low price, but we also want pollution control. And now Swedish uh, county council are starting to ask for emission control and, and things like this when they start to buy drugs. That's a good thing. Norway is also starting now. So it's starting to spread. And, and Great Britain has also said in the National Action Plan that they will do it. Pollution standards in good manufacturing practice. This is a framework that dictates how drugs should be produced to ensure quality. There is a proposal from Sweden in Europe to change the European legislation how drugs should be produced so that should encompass uh, pollution aspects also. The trick here is that everyone wants to export to EU, or at least most wants to do that. And if you change the EU's legislation here, you can actually put pressure also on countries like China and India, etc. National pollution standards, that's good, but we cannot do so much about that. We don't have very much antibiotic production here in Sweden. But very recently, India's government has said, we will now regulate antibiotic emissions. So in their national action plan, they say that they will regulate antibiotic emissions, and they're now talking about using the, the limits that me and my student Yuan proposed a few years ago as national legislation. We'll see if it happens, but it's a good initiative. And some companies also, or, or there's actually, um, actually uh, there's, a, what are they called? They're called Access to Medicines Foundation. They have started to rank companies on how well they work with antibiotic resistance issues. And one of their criteria is how well they control their emissions. So this is one way of creating incentives also to, to, to give them some higher grades in this international ranking. So with that, I'd like to thank you for listening. And uh, this is part of the center that I'm part of, that Anne's also part of. And uh, hope you will, hope you enjoyed it and learned something. Thank you.